Hello, everyone. You're tuned into today's PIR live event, and I'm your host, Scott Jones. Our guest today is Dr. Dent Brent Sinclair, Associate Professor in the Department of Biology at Western University. Welcome to the PIR live event, Dr. Sinclair. Uh, before we get started, I'd also like to welcome the viewers tuning in on the live stream. It's great to have you with us today, as always. And remember that at any time during the event, you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag AskPIR. If there's room in your tweet, please include your name, school, or city, and we'll give you a shout out at that time. So I'll get to those in a, in a minute, but in the meantime, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sinclair, who's going to give us a bit about his background and then the research that he's currently working on. So thank you for joining us, Brent. Hi, everybody. My name is Brent Sinclair. I um, work here at Western University. Um, I'm from New Zealand originally. That's why I talk funny. And on my way to Western, I, I lived and worked in New Zealand and in South Africa and in Las Vegas and in um, England before I ended up here about 10 years ago. And the best thing about being in Ontario is, of course, that we have really good winters. And this is especially good for me because I study insects and what they do at winter time. So I don't think anyone saw anything like this on their way to school this morning. This is a giant cockroach from Madagascar. And there's a couple of reasons why you won't have seen these guys. One is because they don't live here. And the other is because even if they did live here, it's really cold today and they're probably not out and about. So we're going to talk a little bit about, or I'm going to talk a little bit about what insects do in winter and why we don't get these guys crawling down the sidewalk on the, the 10th of February. So let's start off just by thinking about what insects do and what life is like living in Canada. And one of the big things is that we have a lot of winter in Canada. So here's a life cycle of a butterfly and it starts off as an egg and that egg grows as a caterpillar and then it's and then it turns into a chrysalis or a pupa before it turns into an adult that makes more eggs. Now the important thing from my perspective is that more than two thirds of the life of this swallowtail um, butterfly is spent during the winter. So it spends almost more than half of its life as an overwintering insect. And this means that whatever happens in winter is really, really important. Now, it's really important for insects because they are ectotherms. Now, what being an ectotherm means is it means that, that the animals are cold-blooded. So when you go outside, you put on hats and scarves and gloves and things, and that keeps you warm inside. And that keeps the heat that you are generating in there and keeps you warm. Insects don't do that. They don't generate heat that keeps them warm. So even if they wore hats and scarves and gloves and boots and things, they would still be cold on the inside. So there's a big difference between an insect like this caterpillar here and something like a wolverine, see it has a big furry coat, it generates heat, it can go around and, and it can do stuff in the winter. Now one of the big differences is that because it gets really cold in the winter, the body temperature of this caterpillar is going to be about the same as the temperature of the environment. That means that it's minus six outside my office right now. If I had a wolverine outside my office right now, apart from being very surprising, the, the wolverine would also would have a body temperature of still about 37 degrees, the same as what we do. And so what the wolverine does is it burns energy to stay warm. The caterpillar just lets itself cool down and then does stuff over the winter. Now there's one exception to this, not all insects do this, because things like bumblebees and some moths can actually heat their, their um, flight muscles up so that they can fly in the winter or in the early spring. But most of the time the animals we're going to be talking about here are ectotherms, so their body temperature is the same as the temperature of the environment. Now insects and other animals are mostly water. So when we go outside, we don't freeze because we keep our bodies warm. Insects, on the other hand, are, their body temperature is the same as the temperature of the environment. So what do they do? Well, it turns out that when water gets cold, things change, right? So here's a picture of the, the river in London last year. This is the Thames. And we can see a few things from this. So the first thing is that when water gets cold, it freezes. You can see that there's ice on the water here. Okay, so ice is hard and 
what happens with ice is that all of the biochemistry and things that happens inside our cells that keeps us alive doesn't happen in ice. So a frozen insect is not going to have much biochemistry happening. The other thing that happens is that you'll notice that the ice floats on top of the, the water. It doesn't float. It doesn't sink to the bottom. And the reason is that the ice, that the water expands when it turns to ice. So that means it floats. That also means that if water freezes inside your cells, then it expands and can break the cells. So therefore, insects really want to avoid being frozen, or at least you'd think so. So a lot of insects avoid cold just by going somewhere else. Monarch butterflies we know spend the winter in Mexico, so in the fall they fly south from here. Um, acorn weevils, which is a weevil that we've worked on in my lab, these guys burrow into the soil. And you don't have to go very deep, you only have to go maybe, maybe 10 or 20 centimeters before you're at a temperature where you won't freeze, where it's relatively warm. And there are some things like Asian lady beetles and um, there's some invasive species like the, the wonderfully named brown marmorated stink bug that come inside the house over winter. And the, what they do is they come inside and they stay warm. They avoid the cold by finding somewhere that's a little bit warmer that means that they can avoid the winter. But most insects that live here, they don't have anywhere to hide. And here is just some temperatures that we measured in a secret location in my vegetable garden. And we have two different habitats here. We have a habitat in the red, which was insects that were overwintering above the snow. And in the blue, we have insects that were overwintering be uh, below the snow. And what you can see is that it gets really cold. I've got a line across here at zero degrees C, and they all spend a lot of time below zero. Zero is an important temperature because that's when water usually freezes. One thing that you'll notice is that if there's snow on the ground, like there is outside, outside here in London, Ontario today, then the temperature gets really stable. It's like a little insulating layer. It's a little jacket for the ground. Whereas if there isn't snow, then it can get really, really cold. So insects can overwinter in lots of different life stages. We get lots of different kinds of overwintering. This is a butterfly that overwinters in my backyard as, a, as an adult butterfly. This is a caterpillar, the woolly bear caterpillar. Some of you will know these. These are the orange and black guys you see crawling across the road in the fall. And these guys overwinter as a larva, as a caterpillar. There are crickets. This is the Springfield cricket. This overwinters as a baby cricket. Um, I talked before about swallowtail butterflies. This is a, a tiger swallowtail butterfly. They overwinter as a, um, as a pupa or a chrysalis. And there are other species, like this is a cricket egg, that overwinter as an egg. So every single life stage of the, in, of the insect has the capacity to overwinter sometimes in, in different state, situations. So how are we doing, Scott? Do we have any questions that I could answer before I go on? Uh, I certainly do. Um, if it's going to throw you off, we don't have to get to them just yet, but... This is a good time to answer a question or two. Okay, sure. Um, so why don't we start in uh, Rolf Road School in Toronto. Um, and we have a question from Dan who wants to know if larger or smaller bugs survive better in cold weather. Hi, Dan. Um, that's a good question. And the answer is that if bugs have evolved to live here, then they survive well, whether they're large or whether they're small. So there are some really, really tiny bugs that do great over winter. You know about mosquitoes and black flies and things like that. And there are some really big bugs like the, the woolly bear caterpillars. And, and um, I used to work on a, um, on a cricket in New Zealand that is about that long. And they all do well in the winter as well. One way that they differ is that smaller insects find it easier to avoid being frozen, whereas bigger insects often have often will survive ice forming inside their bodies. And we can talk about those different strategies just in a moment, actually. That's actually a good transition. Do you have another question about that, Scott, before I move on? Uh, no, I don't, actually. Okay, so let's move on. So we were talking about how insects overwinter, and I just have something I want to show you. Let me just reach across here. So some of you will have seen these before. These are goldenrod galls. You'll see them sticking out of the snow in the winter. Um, they're going all over my keyboard right now. And 
these each of these little balls on a goldenrod plant contains a little maggot of an animal that we call Eurosta solidaginis. This is another animal that overwinters right around here. And the special thing about these guys is that when we cool them down, they will freeze solid and survive. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening there. So first of all, how do we know that we're frozen? So this is a... Um, this is what we do in my lab all the time. We take one an animal and we attach uh, an insect and we take we attach a little thermocouple to it, so a little mini thermometer, and then we can measure its temperature. So as it cools down, eventually we'll see this little blip. So see this little blip right here. And what this is is this is heat being released by water when it can when it turns into ice. So because of this, we can tell exactly when that insect froze. Now, the cool thing is that some insects will be killed by ice forming like that, and that makes sense, right? I talked about how ice expands when it, or water expands when it turns to ice. But there are others, like our friend the goldenrod gallfly here, he isn't, here he is back, that will actually survive that, that ice formation inside their bodies. So there's actually two choices here. We have animals that survive being frozen, so this is a um, this is a woolly bear caterpillar here, and there are animals that instead use antifreezes to make sure that they don't freeze, and the emerald ash borer is a great example of that. So what we tend to find is that smaller insects tend to use this category, they tend to use the freeze avoidant category, and Bigger insects tend to use the freeze tolerant category, but there's some big insects that do this and there's some bigger insects that do that, so it's not a complete rule. Um, just an example here, this is a, um, an emerald ash borer, it's a, a pinned dead one, you can see it just sitting in here. Um, that's an emerald ash borer adult, and you can see that it's not a very big beetle, it's maybe six millimeters long, so it's not terribly huge. So they're a pretty small little animal. So. One thing to think about is, remember before I said that zero degrees was really important because that's when water freezes? It turns out that there are situations when water freezes at much lower temperatures than that. So here, is a, um, here are some penguins sitting on an ice floe, Antarctica. I, I was actually there working on insects, but, but I saw lots of penguins, and they seem, tend, tend to jump in front of the camera and get photographed a lot. But the important, important thing here is that this water is unfrozen. The water is minus 1.86 degrees, and that's really cold, I know, because I went swimming, right? And it was really, really cold. And the reason it's not frozen is because it's seawater and it's filled with salt. On the other hand, if, if you have very pure water, you can cool it down to minus 20 and keep it unfrozen. So here's just a little video of this. So here's a... Um, a bottle of water that's been in the free in the freezer this person's going to shake it and you're going to see that it's liquid now and then it's going to freeze see it's freezing right from the top to the bottom and that's because it was in a state called super cooled so that's what the emerald ash borer does it stays super cooled it keeps its body fluids unfrozen being small is really important so when you were asking about whether thing when Dan was asking about whether things should be big or small being small is really important for that and they also use antifreezes so they use things like glycerol and they also have special proteins that stop ice from growing the other thing that these guys do is they make sure that ice doesn't start growing and they can do some cool things with that as well so there's our favorite um, freeze avoidant animal, it's the emerald ash borer, it's an invasive species, it also burrows in the wood and my, my postdoc here, Steffi, had to wear a respirator because the dust from all their poo when she was digging them out of the logs got into her lungs. And this is what they do to the trees, this eventually kills the tree and you can peel off the bark and collect lots of, lots of nice animals. This is good for us because we want to know how they survive the winter, it's not so good for the tree. And what we find is that these guys can, can stay unfrozen at minus 30 degrees, right? Most of their blood is made up of glycerol. Most of their blood is made up of antifreeze. This is about the same percentage of stuff in their blood that, that your mum and dad put in the car radiator to stop it freezing over the winter. So it's a lot of stuff in their blood. And that stuff, it turns out, is actually tasty because they use glycerol and it tastes sweet. And so this is one of my students demonstrating that if you eat an emerald ash borer during the winter, it tastes pretty sweet. <laughs> okay.
they have antifreeze proteins at all, and they also have a nice waxy cuticle that stops ice from spreading into the insect. So we call these guys freeze avoidant. Okay, and there's a bunch of things that do this. There are springtails, which are little tiny primitive insects. We have moths that grow in galls, a little bit like these, these Eurosta galls, but they're a bit longer and thinner. Um, lots of insect eggs are freeze avoidant. And there are lots of aphids and leaf hoppers and the, um, the milkweed bugs you might see on milkweed in the, in the summer. All of those are freeze avoidant as well. Right, and also flies. Drosophila and various other things. I have some Drosophila here as well, somewhere. Cool. So this is a this is another um, this is an insect that we caught just outside um, in the summer, and now we grow them in the lab. They look like boring Drosophila that people study in the lab, but actually they're exciting Drosophila because they're ones that live in the live in, live outside. And these ones are particularly interesting because they're invasive from somewhere else. And maybe if people have questions about invasive species, we can talk about those in a moment. So I talked a bunch about freeze avoidance. Do we have any any more questions to to talk about, Scott? Um, sure. Uh, we have one, looks like, from a grade six class at Sandown Public School in Waterloo. Um, and the question is, are insects born with the ability to survive winter, or do they learn and develop that, that ability on their own? Hi, people in Waterloo. Thanks for your question. That's a really great question. Because it turns out that if I take one of these Eurosta animals, if I take one of these guys in the spring, in the summer, they aren't very good at surviving cold at all. In fact, if I cool these guys down, they'll freeze at about minus five degrees and die. Whereas if I took these animals now, we just collected these this morning, and we cooled them down, so there's a little maggot inside. I don't have anything sharp enough in my office to break into this, unfortunately. But if we, but, but you can find them outside, and you can break into them, just ask someone to help you with a knife, and you can crack open these galls and have a look, and there's a little round maggot in there. If I freeze this guy now, he'll freeze at about minus six or minus eight degrees. So they're probably frozen outside my office right now. And they won't die until well below minus 40. In fact, the record for these guys is minus 86 degrees. Now, that's pretty good because the lowest temperature we've ever seen on Earth is minus 89. So they can survive pretty much anything. But they develop that over the over the course of the fall. So when fall comes along, the plant that they live in starts to, to dry out and die back. And the, the insect is a cue that winter is coming. Other insects will use changes in the length of the day as the day gets shorter, or sometimes changes in the temperature. And what it then does is it says, whoa, winter's coming. It starts to accumulate some of these some of these special molecules that allow it to survive freezing. So in the case of the, the gall fly here, it starts to accumulate glycerol. It starts to do things with the way that its cells are organized and stuff like that. So that over a period of about four weeks, it goes from not being cold tolerant to being very cold tolerant. And this is the same with almost every insect, that they all um, develop cold tolerance tolerance and usually at a very specific life stage. So that's re so it's really important for them to synchronize their development with what's happening outside because if they're in the wrong life stage then they can't survive the winter. Okay, uh, all very amazing stuff. Um, I'll get to the questions which are coming in fast and furious. Um, so we have one from, from Toronto again and I just have the Twitter handle here but it's uh, Max Stemsai. Uh, and they want to know, um, do the changing winter patterns affect the insects? Um, and are they still following their life cycle if the patterns are changing? Yeah, so that's a great question as well. Do, do changing winters affect insects? So, yes, they affect insects, but we're still trying to understand how and, to, to, and how much. And one thing to remember is that winters differ from year to year. So we get long-term changes, climate change, but even from one year to the next, winter can be different. Sometimes in November, there's lots of snow. Sometimes in November, there's no snow. So insects are very flexible at doing this. And so one way that they, they are very good at this is that in the fall, the, the main cue that they use is usually the, the changing day length. They don't rely on temperature because temperature is an unreliable cue for the start of winter because sometimes it's cold in September, sometimes it's not cold until late December, but you need to be ready for winter whenever it comes. So that means that they use, that, that means that they have a program system that allows them to be ready for winter regardless of what the particular conditions are that are happening just outside 
In the spring, they often re re they often respond to um, temperature specifically. So what this means is that if spring comes early, the insects can develop quickly and can take advantage of that. But if spring comes late, then they can take a little bit longer and um, and develop at the right time. Now this all starts to break down a bit when we get very strange things happening in winter. So if, for example, it's super warm for a few weeks in the middle of winter, and that's just happened here in Ontario, right? Then some insects will actually start to develop. They'll think that it's spring and start to develop, and then when it gets cold again, they may be not as good at um, not as good at tolerating the cold, and maybe they might be killed by low temperatures. Then another thing is that there are some species that um, that that rely on it being cold so that they can save energy. So if it's very warm over the winter, then they might end up using more energy than um, than they might otherwise prefer. Now the trick is that f there's so many different kinds of insects. There's tens of thousands of species of insects just here in southern Ontario. That means that it's very hard to say this is how cold affects insects because it. it really depends on the life cycle of the insect and the particular stage at which it's overwintering. But that's a great question. All right, so um, you kind of clued me on to something else that's come, come in here, and this one's back from uh, Rolf Road School. Uh, this one's from Matt, and he wants to know, uh, what is the most common type of ectotherm in Canada? Hi, Matt. I think the most common type of ectotherm in Canada has to be an insect. So almost all the animals... Um, in the world are insects. In fact, all, in fact, more than 70% of the animals for which we have scientific names are insect species. And it's the same in Canada. So um, just some, some numbers, not necessarily um, insects, but arthropods in general. When I was um, in the, the summer, I was working up in the Yukon and in the, the Arctic tundra, for every square meter of tundra, there are 11 spiders. Okay, so there are a lot of spiders, and then remember that spiders are predators, so probably for every spider there have to be 10 or 20 insects. So there are, there are thousands of insects per square meter uh, um, in the tundra, and this is a much better place to live than the Arctic tundra, so there are a really, really large number of insects all around us. So the most common animals in, the, the most common animals in, in um, Canada are insects, hands down. Okay, good to know. Um, so I'll go back to uh, Sandown uh, School, and this is from a grade five class, and uh, they want to know what is the typical percentage of water found in the average insect? Oh, good question. How much of an insect is water? So usually insects are about 70% water, the same as most other animals. With some kind of particularly squishy things, so some caterpillars and things like that, it might be up more around 80 or 85%. And for many overwintering insects, they start to dehydrate over the winter. So some insects might start off at 70% water, but they dehydrate over the winter and they might be down around 50% water by the time we reach the end of the winter. That's a great question as well. Good. There's a whole other, other live event we could do about how insects deal with, with being in dry environments as well, because that's really fascinating. Certainly, certainly. Um, I, I do have some, some pre-submitted questions um, that came in prior to us starting today. Um, from That's cool. Can I just maybe, just before we get on to some more questions, Scott, there's just one more cool little thing that I'd like to, to talk about if we have time, which sure, yeah. covers some of the other cold tolerance, which is that there are a whole bunch of insects. These are our woolly bear caterpillars again that can survive being frozen solid. And I just wanted to mention that because we've talked a lot about freeze avoidance and not very much about the animals like the gall, gall flies that can freeze solid. These guys freeze at minus 7, they survive to about minus 20, and they also have lots of glycerol in their blood. Um, and there are lots of things that can survive internal ice formation. And the way they do this, because we're talking about water, this is what reminded me, is that they actually rely on ice inside their bodies to dehydrate their cells. So what we end up with is here's a cell here, and ice forms on the outside, and it concentrates the fluid on the outside of the cell, which sucks water out, which means that the cell itself is dehydrated but not frozen. So insects, because they're so great at dealing with dehydration, to survive freezing, what they've done is they've turned an ice problem into a dehydration problem, which is pretty neat. So there's our two cold tolerance strategies up there on the screen for, for people that want to pay attention to that. Um, 
But let's get back to the, there are a couple more questions that you wanted to ask Scott. So let's let's do uh, that. Okay, certainly. Um, so I've got a couple uh, that kind of want to get at the same thing, and it gets at the the title of your talk, which is "Do Bugs Get Goosebumps?" So so what is the the answer to that question? Okay, so bugs don't get goosebumps because the reason that we get goosebumps is because we are endotherms, we're mammals, and we're and so we evolved or our, our, our ancestors a long, long time ago had furry coats. And if you have a look on a cold winter morning, if you see chickadees or woodpeckers sitting on a bird feeder, they're all puffed up. And the reason they do that is that they are trying to make give themselves a bigger down jacket, right? They're giving themselves a really thick down jacket to keep themselves insulated. So mammals do that as well. So you'll see squirrels will puff themselves up as well. And the way they do that is they have a little muscle that erects the, the their, their fur that means that it goes from being flattened to being tall, which means that you have a much, la a much thicker fur layer on the outside. Now, what, when you get goosebumps, what you're trying to do there is you're trying to um, you're trying to make your fur bigger, and because not many of us humans are very furry anymore, that doesn't really work very well. So when you get goosebumps in the cold, it's just your your um, your evolutionary history trying to make you a little bit more insulated. So insects don't get goosebumps, not least because many of them are not very furry. Yeah. So that's good to know. I was keen to, to ask that question myself, so I'm glad we got the answer <laughs> to that. Um, okay, uh, so back to a grade five class in Sandown uh, Public School. Um, they want to know if there's things, so if bugs, first of all, can survive multiple winters, and, and if that's the case, uh, is that why we see some sort of like invasive species spreading as rapidly as they do, because they can survive these winters? Yeah, so so there are several, there are lots of different life cycles in insects. So many insects have a life cycle where they will have multiple generations within a year. So only one generation will overwinter. And in the case of the butterflies I was talking about, the ones that the the generation that overwinters has very different physiology to the one that doesn't overwinter because the one that doesn't overwinter doesn't have to invest any energy into being cold tolerant. There are some insects that are that have one rotation of the life cycle a year. So woolly bear caterpillars, for example, they are a moth and then that lays an egg which grows up into a um, grows up into a caterpillar and the caterpillar always overwinters and then that caterpillar grows again in the fall and it turns into a moth. But there are some insects that take a long time to develop and the further north we go and summers get shorter and maybe there isn't long enough for the entire life cycle and so we get some insects that will take many years to um to many, many years to to reach adulthood and this goes right up to a um caterpillar in greenland which we think might take 7 years to go from being an egg to being an adult so that's a really long time so that individual will have survived for 7 winters will have survived 7 arctic winters um in terms of invasive species, there are lots of invasive species, and here's one of them with these these um, Drosophila suzukii, spotted wing Drosophila, that um, are probably limited in their um, ability to move into Canada because of the cold. And with emerald ash borer, one thing that we found is that they survive cold really, really well, but the trick is that sometimes they need to be in the right life stage to do it. So if the winters get, if the summers get too short, then they can't grow fast enough. So if they can't overwinter in several different life stages, then they won't be able to survive here. So flexibility in life cycle is actually a really, really important component of being able to survive in um, in a new environment, and especially in, in especially for moving from southern habitats to northern ha habitats. And we see this even with native insects that in the north of their range they might take um, there might be several generations or there, it might take several years for one generation but when we go to the south of their range perhaps in Florida or something they might have several generations a year and so that's a really good question and understanding those life cycles is really important for understanding how um, in, how um, invasive species might survive in Canada okay so we're getting a, a bit short on time here I'll try and fit in another question or two though um, so one that just came in from Bella Avenue Community School in Toronto, 
Um, so obviously we're aware of the fact that spiders, for example, they crawl into, they like to crawl into our beds and into our shoes. Mm -hmm. Is this because they, they don't like the cold? Is that what they're trying to get warm? There are some spiders that are, are only here because they can survive inside houses, but most spiders, if they're inside, they've kind of gotten in there by mistake. Um, one thing about spiders is that if there is food, you know, if there are other insects around and things, then a house is a great place to go hunting. But if they're crawling inside shoes and things like that, I think it's mostly because they're just looking for a good little hiding place, right? It's a nice dark spot, and that's the main reason that they're going in there. They're not looking for somewhere that's specifically warmer or, or more cozy or because they like eating toes or anything like that. I see. We have, very, we have no toe-eating spiders in Canada. Okay, good to know. <laughs> um, okay, so what, why don't I give you uh, one more then? Uh, and I think this is very uh, topical for sure, uh, which is that um, how, how would you expect climate change to affect the survival and evolution of, of insects? Right, forward? so this is... This is a really big question, and it's what occupies a lot of my research right now, is trying to figure this out. And the, the answer that I always give, which no one ever likes because it's not a very satisfying answer, is it depends. So it's, remember I said that there were tens of thousands of different insects, and what that means is that different insects are going to respond in different ways. So insects with flexible life cycles are going to respond, are going to do better than insects without flexible life cycles. Insects that have very flexible physiology that can survive lots of different environmental stresses or, um, or, can, res or can respond to strange weather conditions are going to do better than insects that have a very fixed kind of life cycle. But what that means is that for those animals that maybe have um, relatively little flexibility and things like that, there's going to be very strong selective selection pressures for them to be able to respond to those climate changes as well. So I can't give specific answers. And, and I would say that if there is one big question in, in the whole of insect physiology right now, it's, it's how do we understand which insects are going to be winners and which are going to be losers under climate change? So that's a really, really important question and one that I think we all need to be thinking about and asking, but that we don't have an answer to yet. Right. Uh, well, we've had uh, lots of uh, interaction over Twitter here, and uh, I hope I've got to all the schools that have sent in their questions. Um, you're, you're probably right, right we could have filled another half an hour with all the questions we've got, but um, unfortunately I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you again to our live stream viewers and of course to you, Dr. Sinclair, for taking our time to answer all of our questions and share your expertise with us. So thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. It's been so much fun. Okay. Uh, and before we sign off, I'd just like to give a quick plug to our next event, which will be uh, next week when we have actually two events on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, Tuesday is, is Dr. Glenn Caitler from SAIT Polytechnic. We'll talk about radio frequency ID tagging. And then on the Thursday, we'll talk to Dr. Ning Yan, who will talk to us about tree bark biorefinery projects from the University of Toronto. So that's a lot to look forward to next week. But thank you again, Dr. Sinclair. Thank you. All right. Bye for now, everyone.